we're in the middle of a service of a series on relationships as a church. We've been talking about relationships, about marriages, and this evening we're going to carry on for all of the singles, the not yet married. I'm going to sort of wrap up that week. We've got a great week so far. Darlington and Edna shared some great wisdom with us, and Nicole and Mark who had a fantastic session with us on Wednesday night. Janetta did a brilliant session on Tuesday. And we're wrapping that up tonight. If you missed those sessions and you're single, or you know of single people who are needing to grow in relationships, then you're welcome to just point them to the podcast as well, where they can catch up on those sessions. And this morning, it's really just a, a great privilege to welcome Christu, who drove through from Potts this morning to come and minister to us. He's got a passion for marriage. As he told me a while ago, he says, if he could just leave the church and, and just do ma- marriages, man- ministry all day, he'd be happy with that. He loves marriage. He's got a passion to see marriages flourish. And this morning, he's going to be sharing with us a little bit from Song of Solomon, but also broader than that. So it's great having him here. Unfortunately, Andri, his wife, wasn't able to join. She's on duty at their church back in Poch this morning, serving there, and their beautiful kid, Amu Halang, who's three years old. And it's just been so amazing to see Chris to grow, not only as a pastor, but as a father and as a husband over these last three years, and excited to receive from you. So welcome, thank you for the and we really look forward to hear what the Lord's laid on your heart. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, everyone. It is a massive blessing to be you, with you this morning. Um, as Phil said, I, I do love the ministry, um, especially marriages and marriage preparation and, and everything that the Lord is, has been doing through building His church through marriages. I, I honestly believe that God is in this time building His kingdom with healthy marriages. And I believe that, that we're living in a time where, where, where people are struggling to understand what marriage is about, what it's for, um, and, and we're so confused in the world. If, if we look at confusion in the world, it's predominantly a misunderstanding of, of what God's heart is regarding marriage um, specifically. And our testimony, my wife and I, um, is predominantly regarding our marriage and I think it's because the Lord used us in a way and did something through our marriage that we started understanding, hey, there's, there's a ministry needed. And, and we wish that there were people for us when we had to get married um, so that we didn't have the problems that we had specifically in our marriage at that time. But I'll, I'll get to that as we go. Um, this morning, I also bring, we, uh, brought my brother Tyron uh, Tyron is one of the guys that I disciple. Uh, we, we are actively uh, joining on Wednesday mornings and Thursday mornings um, and with the students on Tuesday mornings. I've got a few discipleship groups and we focus on fatherhood and what that looks like. And, and Tyron has got a calling on his life to be a wonderful dad. And uh, he's married and he's got a bunch of, bunch of children. And uh, I'm just thankful for, for my brother that could join me this morning. Um, we, we also had an incredible week. We had Freedom Week. So as you have Legacy coming up for this weekend, I really want to encourage you to do this. Um, make sure not to, to miss these type of events where you encounter Christ and His freedom for what that is. So, so we had our Encounter 3 Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday evening, and then Friday evening and Saturday, yesterday until 5 o'clock, yesterday afternoon, we had our Deliverance Encounter and it was so powerful to see how the Lord is moving and setting people free from bondages, from shackles, from, from especially the young uh, people, um, our congregation, about 50% of our, our congregation are students. And it's great to see what God is doing in the midst of them and setting people through, uh, free from their selves and from sin. Quickly, something about myself. I partly grew up in Pretoria, right here. Um, I was in Lasko in Laris Park. We lived in Pierre van Reineveld. And last night, for some reason, I remembered our exact address was Dean Lane number 10. Um, and it's so interesting that I vividly remember that because I, we lived there when I was 7 to 10 years old. And, and even now, remembering that and remembering vividly what God did in that stages of my life 
uh, growing up in Pretoria and just thinking, coming back to Pretoria today and ministering here today, um, it's fascinating to me that how I can remember those exact details and how God is so in the details in, in doing incredible things. In short, this is my wife, um, Anri, that one. Um, and the one in the middle is our daughter, Amukhalang. We call her Amu. Um, Amukhalang, that you know, means welcomed, accepted, and appreciated. Uh, we love her to bits. She's been with us for two years. I also see that she is on the uh, advertisement of convergence. So you see there's a lady holding Amu, okay? And that's our best friend, uh, Busi. She's our office manager in Pot. She also lives with us. And uh, she holds Amu, and it's so great. I just took a photo again, and I sent it on our home family WhatsApp group, and I said, you're going famous. Everybody's using this, and I can't wait to tell my daughter when I get back home that she is getting famous, I guess, across Shofar just with a Convergence video uh, that was actually taken off her just outside the building here um, with Convergence two years ago. But yeah, that's my wife and our daughter. As Phil said, she is uh, presenting our kids' church this morning. Um, and Amu couldn't wait for her mom. It's her turn and her mom to come and present at Keith's church. So, so she couldn't get away. I want to start this morning by saying that I am not a perfect sinless pastor. I'm not standing here in front because I achieved something and you haven't. Um, the only reason why God put a calling on my life to share is for me to to fit into the place that I fit into the body. Does that make sense? Because a lot of time we, we sit in church and, and we think that there's, there's some people that reach a status and when they get there, the Lord will use them and maybe I just haven't arrived yet. And I, and I want to share with you this morning that there's different functions in the body. There's, there's the band that has a very specific role. Well done to the band this morning. Just thank you for ushering us into the presence of God. And it's, it's always so, so precious to see how God is faithful when we rock up and worship Him in spirit and truth. And, and that's how we all have a specific role in church that we have to. And, and for me, that role in this season is to pastor. So I worked at the university for 10 years um, and, and did a bunch of things there. And then Giliu came and planted our church. Uh, where the elders approached me and said, you know, you should be praying about becoming a pastor. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not supposed to pray about that. So no, I don't want to do those things. Um, that, that's a place for people who, who sort it out. They sorted out their sins. And, you know, that's their place. And he said, no, 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 you should really pray about this. There's a calling on your life. And we walked this road out. And, and then Phil and Gilly and I went and we played golf in Poch for him to meet me. And, um, yeah, we just walked this journey out at the end of 2020. And it is a real pleasure for me to minister, but I, I really want you to hear that I'm not perfect. I'm not sinless. And what I'm sharing this morning is what God is saying, and, and I love His Word. And, and with that, that helps me to present the truth to you, and that it's not only from myself. My wife and I, we started dating at school. Um, we met one another when we were 10 years old. Um, my mom moved, moved with my brother and I to Brits from all places. And... Um, so one good thing that happened there is I met my wife when I was 10 years old. And we started dating at the end of matric. And then we went through university. Both of us went to the book and uh, studied there. She started pharmacy, become a pharmacist. And then we got married at the young age of 23. And uh, we continued in our marriage for about four years. And then we joined a small group in Shofar. And one night we, we had a, a, a marriage seminar. And we did that in small group. And when, one of the things that we did is we had to repent to one another. And Andre and I, we sat and we started repenting about the little things. Hey, sorry I spoke loudly last week. And sorry I did that. And sorry I don't help with the dishes. You know, you start with the, with the, with the little things that's actually becoming the bigger things. And, and as we started repenting, we saw that, okay, well, well, the Lord really wants to untangle some things. And that brought us to a place that we continued this confession, and something jump-started in our marriage there that, that Henri told me, well, she, she just feels so numb in our marriage. She wants to exit. Uh, this is not a great place to be. This is not healthy. We did not really go as pure as we wanted to into marriage, and we weren't very honest about it. So, you know, rather we should just get divorced. And, and, and we were faced with this reality. 
is what now? We, we just joined the church, and the church said, repent, now we repented, and now we're like, okay, well, we really don't like one another now. So, we're 26 years old, young, where to from here? And God met us in that, and we, we continued with this repentance, and, and from that place, God jump-started something in our marriage. And it's nine years on, about, and, and we see how God was so faithful when he met us, when we were honest with one another, repenting about what was the lead up to our marriage, what happened in our marriage, and that we needed to find a place to be honest. And then later on, what was further grown in our relationship was a deeper revelation of Jesus being the slayed lamb on the throne. We did a series on, in Revelation about who Jesus really is. And, and for the first time, I, I realized that I needed to step back and, and acknowledge him as king and lord. He's not just my savior, but he's also lord. And there was something about lordship that brought our marriage to a place that we had to repent and sort this out. So I started reading a book uh, at the end of last year um, about a guy who talks about, about prayer. And I thought, hey, I, I earnestly want to grow in my prayer life. And as, we, as I read through the book, he talked about revival in the school as a child. And as I read through the chapters, and it began, I, be, I began actively to implement his actions in each chapter. And I just realized the importance of a healthy marriage and that my marriage is the image of Christ and his church to the world. Paul says that it is the only thing that we can look to today in this time where the relationship between Christ and his church is shown to the world. So family, church, my question to you this morning, if you're sitting here and you're married, when people look at your marriage, do they see the relationship between Christ and his church? Because the reality is if they look at your marriage and they see that, they're supposed to come to faith in Christ by looking at your marriage. I did a wedding on Friday afternoon. It was, I don't know, my ninth or tenth wedding for the year. There's a lot of students in our church, and they all get married. So, so, so we just take all of them through marriage prep of a minimum of three and a half to four months. My wife, when she gets off from being a pharmacist and being in the military, she gets home, and then she walks into marriage prep. That's, that's how the house runs. And, and we love to spend time with people walking through this. And I think it's so important for us to realize one thing. is people looking at your marriage and seeing the relationship between Christ and his church. Amen? Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you that we can worship you in spirit and truth. And we ask, Lord, that you would reveal your heart to us this morning. May it be clear. May it be direct. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I want to start with a golden nugget about cherishing. So did you know that Adam, when he saw Eve... There was literally no one else he could compare Eve to. Eve defined womanhood to Adam. So as a man looking after animals and God giving him the instruction to name all the animals, you lion, you elephant, you ant. When he was done with that, God gave him one that looked like him. And he said, finally one that God has given me. Eve defined womanhood to Adam. And Adam defined man to Eve. Adam could not compare Eve to literally any other person. It would be like at your wedding day, if you've ever been to a wedding and you see the husband there in front, he usually stands on the side, okay? And then he looks to the pastor, and then the pastor nods, yes, she's coming in, and then he turns around, and he starts weeping. Have you been to those weddings? Okay. So, so I have the privilege of being at a lot of weddings. So I constantly have to keep myself back from also crying, because then we're not, just not going to get through the wedding. And, and it's that moment. It's that moment when the husband sees the wife. And it's like, that's the definition of beauty. 
It's the definition of womanhood. That's my wife, my soon-to-be wife. Do you hear that? Do you hear that there's, there's something that is lost in translation, lost in our culture, lost with that bike, about how we see women as men and how men sees women. And then I, I get to this part in Song of Solomon and we, we've done this co- uh, conference, we, we call it for the student sex conference, but it's actually this uh, Song of Solomon conference where we literally dive into every verse in the book of Song of Solomon. Now there's eight chapters, my favorite book in the Bible, because it's the book in the Bible where God directly talks about marriage, directly talk about sex, directly talk about courtship about how to be married for long. If you're in marriage and you do not know this book, I honestly believe that you do not fully understand the heart of God for marriage. And it's, it's not because you haven't read the book, but there's so much God uncovers about why marriage, how marriage, and how we should do it. And then there's this incredible verse where Solomon writes, chapter 6, verse 9, and he says, My dove... My perfect one, you are the only one. My dove, my perfect one, you are the only one. Now let that sink in for a moment, husbands, wives. If your husband or wife tells you, you, if your husband tells you why, you are my dove, my perfect one, you are the only one. How do you feel? like this there's no other woman on this on the face of the earth that defines woman to me as Adam for the first time saw Eve that's how Solomon saw this woman being married you are my wife you define woman to me the wife says the same to the husband you define what it means to be a man and a husband to me that is really when you feel cherished. When there's, a, there's an awakening in your heart. It's like my husband sees me and only me. He only has eyes for me. He wants me. He desires me. He loves me. And he pursues friendship with me and only me. Like there's no other person on the face of the earth that, that this person has this relationship with. This is my husband. Did you know that your husband and your wife have the constant need to be fully known and fully accepted? And you need to listen up. If you're not married yet, these are one of the things that you want to develop. You want to come to a place that when you have friendship, you want to be open to talk, men, about our feelings. A wife has a desire to hear from her husband. How do you feel? What's going on? What's your heart's desire? What's what's the things that keep you up at night? What's your worries? And the problem is that husbands start taking these concerns away from their wives. They don't open up and say, Hey, I, I have worries and I have fears. And here they are. It's being open. Paul literally says that the husband should love his wife like Christ loves his church. Ephesians 5, and most probably if you go to a wedding, that will be preached. If you go to a wedding, that I will do, I will definitely preach that. It's, it's a place where Paul instructs, instructs husband to love his wife like Christ loves the church. Ridiculous. The bar is so high. That it's only by Christ and by His grace that we can in any way pursue that. But husbands, we are called to cherish and love our wives as Christ did. Cherish. Only person. My dove. My perfect. You can open up your Bibles in 1 Peter 2. It's also going to be on the screen. I love the Word of God. I love church history. 
I studied theology, I worked at the Faculty of Theology, and I love to see how when we dive into the depth of the Word, and that changes us, and we allow the Holy Spirit to bring and breathe this alive, that we see that people really change. Amen? We're going to read two chapters. As I said, I love the Word of God. If you haven't read a lot of Bible this week, we're going to catch up this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 1. Peter writes, remember who this Peter is. It's the one that denied Jesus three times. Also, the same Peter that Jesus restored three times and said, Peter, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep, Peter. And here we can read something of this restored new Peter feeding the sheep. Verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is God good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Amen. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Talking about the Jews not realizing that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus become a rock of offense to them. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Talking about the Gentiles. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of salvation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. Ever wanted to know what the will of God is? This is the will of God. That by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants for God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Put that in your fridge. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was the seed found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Backdrop. This is who Peter talks to. This is who we are. Once we were lost, now we are saved by the shepherd. We are not sheep without a shepherd. We have a shepherd. Family, are you a sheep for the shepherd? Or are you part of the goats? 
Are you a sheep with a shepherd? Now he talks to these sheep. Likewise, wives. Wives who see themselves as sheep from Christ. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even when some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see you respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishably beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for, this is you were, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, Let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are upon their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, to, you know, to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Family, this passage is so rich and I want to encourage you to go and read it again and again and again and again this week. Ask the Lord to reveal his heart to you. As you are surrendering to the gospel of who he is. And then he talks specifically to wives, husbands, and to our daily lives. How we should act towards our masters, our bosses, the people you work for. But I want to focus this morning on 1 Peter 3 verse 7 and 8. In this context, listen to it. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to women as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you on the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. I want to focus on this as I believe that this touches the heart of marriages that fail or are even in constant conflict. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, in the culture of today, this seems very misogynistic. Women are just as strong as men. Well, I would even argue that women are emotionally stronger than men. And a lot of the time that the women, at least in our church, is more spiritually mature than men. Last year, I had this massive problem with a bunch of couples that we've been taking through marriage prep, that the men are not spiritual mature enough to marry this person, this wife, this woman which is in our culture today a massive problem 
because we see very mature women in Christ. Don't see there's, I don't say there's no men. I just see a lot of women standing up and few men. So let me unpack this quickly for us. The meaning of weaker vessel, specifically that word means that a woman should be honored for being like porcelain. It means that I should honor my wife and hold her and talk to her and love her as she is perfect and uniquely created by God. I should honor her for being exactly who God made her to be. Kind, sensitive, tender. I should honor her that God did not make a mistake when he created her. Some of us, when we're married and, and time goes by, and we're like, Lord, please change this person. Don't raise your hand, but is that true? Just, just change the other person in my marriage. Okay? Maybe you made a mistake, Lord. I'm sitting here with this person. I should honor her and speak to her in a very specific way that honors God. Why? Peter says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. It's big words. Do you understand as the husband that your wife is part of the grace of, uh, the grace of God in your life? The grace of God is the fact that you have a wife, husbands. The fact that you have a husband, wives, is because of the grace of God. And hopefully in your marriage preparation or even just studying the word of God, you concluded that your wife is a gift and that you should handle her properly. Hopefully your dad taught you that. Or in the absence of your dad, a spiritual leader. You should handle her like porcelain. One of the biggest revelations of marriage for me a couple of years ago was the next part. Peter says there's, there's a reason we should do this. And it's so that your prayers may not be hindered. What? Peter writes that if men don't honor their wives as porcelain and speak harshly to them, physically abusing them, or maybe just not loving them as well as God calls them to, that God may close his ears for your prayers. Let that sink in for a moment. And I want to include the wives for a moment. If you as the wife don't love your husband well, that he may honor you as the weaker vessel. Like porcelain. God will close his ears to your spiritual head of the house. It's his prayers. Wives, you have the obligation to allow your husband to honor you as the weaker vessel. It's how God put it together. It's a promise. Husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Do you experience a lack of the presence of God in your marriage? Do you experience that your prayers are in a way hindered even in your marriage? It's like, God, we have these promises, and we hold on to the promises, but we don't see they come to fruition. Do you maybe experience that, you're, that you pray for your children, your finances, or even for a clear understanding of just who God is? There's a prerequisite to your prayers in marriage to handle your wife as porcelain, as the weaker vessel. You can declare that Jesus is Lord and, you could, and it can only be lip service. If we are confessing Christ before people, but back at home you are harsh with your wife. You don't cherish her as Christ calls you to cherish her. She's not your dove, my perfect one, not my only one. Because I'm sitting in pornography and all these other things and just allowing my thought and my mind just to run wild and free and rampant. But my wife, my husband is not being cherished as my one and only one. 
If you find yourself that you don't honor your wife as the weaker vessel and as porcelain, God will not listen to your prayers. Family, this is maybe a harsh word this morning, but it's so direct. And, and I believe that this is a key to unlocking marriages. As in my marriage, this was one of the massive reasons, four years in, when Anri and I had to look one another in the eye and be honest, that I don't cherish her. I didn't cherish her for many years. And I had to repent of this. I had to repent that, that she was not my dove. The one that I cherish being soft spoken with. She's not my only one. There was a bunch of stuff in my life that's not okay. She's not my only one. She's not the one that I love and cherish and being soft with. And verse 8 has the recipe to cultivate an honoring marriage. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Having unity of mind in the body of Christ is of the essence, especially when we take communion together. Having unity in marriage is the only way to move forward in marriage. Having sympathy for one another in struggles and suffering. Do you still have a tender heart for the suffering that your, that your spouse is going through? Do you prepare yourself to have a tender heart for marriage one day? To have friendship where I have a soft heart and I can hear people. I can hear my friends and I can sit with them and I can cry with them when they're going through suffering. It will make a great spouse out of you. That's what we, that's what we aim for, soft hearts. So that God can come and correct the areas in our life that's not doing well. Love is not just a fuzzy feeling that the world proclaims out there. It's not hugs and kisses. It's a self-sacrificial love. Every time you read the word love in the Bible, you can add to it self-sacrificial love. It's not hugs and kisses. It's not, it's not only the feeling. The feeling is part of the emotion that when I self-sacrificially love it draws people into the fact that I honestly believe that they love me. The word says, for this is love that a man will give his life for his friends. Family, a tender heart. Is your heart tender? Is your heart tender towards your spouse? I see it in the word of God and I believe it with my whole heart. That the only way to cherish your spouse and to honor your wife as the weaker vessel is when we have tender hearts. Pride will not get you anywhere. We went through a series in Daniel in our church a few months ago. And there's this scary verse in Daniel that says, there's a day for the pride, for the proud. God has put out a day in the future for the proud. There's a day of reckoning coming for the proud. One day. There's a lot of sin. There's a day God put out for the proud. May we not be that in our marriage. That God had to put out a day because of the pride in your marriage. But let's look to the example Jesus has given us on the cross. I forgive because Jesus forgave me first. I believe that people who struggle to forgive their spouses have not allowed God to fully reveal forgiveness to them. A great theologian wrote that if we have truly received the revelation of what God has forgiven us from, we will forgive all people all the time for all sin. If we understand what God has forgiven us from, we will forgive all people all the time from all sin. Tender heart. And I believe God wants to give you this revelation this morning. And you need to change the soil of your heart to receive this this morning. Jesus talks about this parable in Luke 8. And I'm not going to read it. But we know it so well of the different soil of our hearts. That the gospel goes out and it falls on different soil. What's the soil of your heart this morning? You determine the soil of your heart. God will not rush in 
and just put a bunch of water on you so that you can be softened. But sometimes by the grace of God that happens. You go through suffering and you go through things and through the grace of God He leads us that the soil of our heart is being thrown around so that there can be some change so that you can actually hear what God wants to say. But family, may we not be that. May we allow God to come and change the soil of our hearts. What does the soil of your heart look like in your marriage? And if you're not married yet, these are the characteristics you want to look out for in a person when you want to get married. Having unity in mind. Sympathy. Real sympathy. Brotherly love. Friendship. Brotherly love meaning self-sacrificial love. A tender heart. And a humble mind. Not being proud. We listen to this and we realize, Jesus, we need you. Anybody sitting here this morning is like, oh, got that. Anyone? It's like, that's my marriage. But the reality is we all need Jesus. We all need his grace. We all need forgiveness. And when we have a tender heart, we can have these relationships, these marriages, and these conversations. I shared regarding cherishing your wife and your husband. If we aim for cherish, but we don't have tender hearts, it will not last. If we aim to cherish, but do not have tender hearts, it will not last. You will go home, and you will, oh, you are perfect, you're so beautiful, and this is great. And then she drops the plate with your food, like, oh, you're so ridiculous. Can you? And, and we just miss it again. It's not what God calls us in our marriages. You and I need Jesus. We can't only use him as a magic word. He's not a genie. And he will not listen to your prayers if you do not have a soft heart towards your spouse. So what now? We confess and we repent daily. Joyous repentance. We repent until it becomes joyful. Amen? Sometimes we, we like, I, I want to repent now, but I hate every moment of this. Then we start to repent and we confess our sin to one another. My wife is my accountability partner now. I need her to be that. Once a week she sits me down and asks, how's it going with your thoughts, with your mind? What, come, what came up this week? What's troubling you in your heart? Do you have that friendship with your wife? It's not like our marriage is perfect and I want to say be, have our marriage. I'm just saying that there was so many stuff we needed to address. And now we've seen God and what he can do and what marriage is for. And once you see that, you want to aim and hitting that every time. I've been walking a road with Tyra now for about five, six months. And God radically intervened into his life in a way that on our... You know, conversations in the car on the way here this morning. He told me again that his wife is like, you really changed weirdly very fast. And they've been married for a long time. Went through a very rough patch. Got together again. And they are aiming at doing marriage well. If that is you this morning, I want to urge you to, to have a conversation with him after the service. That he can pray with you. Just in, in how he realized that the thing that needed to change was not his spouse, was him. It's not the other person that needs to change in the marriage. It's me that needs to change. Me that needs to have a soft heart. Confession starts by acknowledging your sin to God and your spouse. We cannot only confess to God and then just continue if nothing happened. We should ask for forgiveness. Repentance is to turn and not to do it again. You can't go to your spouse and say, hey, I'm sorry I did this wrong, and then tomorrow you just do it again. It's a full change. Repentance is not saying sorry. Sorry is saying sorry. Repentance is apologizing and then turning your ways and never doing it again. That's true repentance. And I want us to take a few minutes in silence right there where you are. Can we just close our eyes for a second? And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, 
the helper to come and show you your shortcomings, your sin, the things you need to confess to him and to your spouse. Lord Jesus, we need you. Oh Lord, how we need you. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and show us our hearts this morning. I ask, Lord, that your Spirit would enlighten us to understand what's going on and show us the status of our hearts. I ask, Lord, that you would come and soften it. Show us, Lord, how to repent, where to repent, and where we should start from to repent to you. As David said, Lord, to you and you alone have I sinned, that we can start in repentance to you firstly, God. Lord, come and change our hearts, soften our hearts, so that we can continue as we leave here, Lord, that we can have these discussions amongst one another, husbands and wives. And for those, Lord, that, of us that wants to get married one day and are so fearful of the world, Lord, come and help us to see what you want to come and do and what it looks like to be the husband or wife that honors you. A marriage, Lord, that cherishes you. A marriage, Lord, that actually proclaims what you have called it to be. A marriage, Lord, that when people look at it, they will come to faith in Christ for the way that husband and wife submits and loves and cherishes one another. And I pray this over this family this morning, Lord. I pray for healing and restoration. I pray, Lord, that this morning would be a turning point. I pray, Lord, that this would be a day that marks a time, Lord, that nothing will remain the same. But a process of sanctification, a process of marriage, Lord, will start today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.